So my name is Jason Harden, Upland Game Bird Specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. I was invited here today to uh, speak with you about turkeys in Texas, primarily on eastern turkeys, but I'll cover some uh, aspects of Rios and, and uh, other things as well. Now there's only one species of turkey in North America, and that's the North American wild turkey. However, there are five subspecies of wild turkey, and we're fortunate enough here in Texas to have three of those subspecies, the Rio Grande wild turkey, the eastern wild turkey, and the Miriam's wild turkey. The only other species of turkey is the oscillated turkey, which occurs primarily in the Yucatan Peninsula and parts of Central America. This map shows the distribution of the three subspecies here in Texas. As you can see, in the Davis Mountains of West Texas, there's a small area occupied by Miriam's wild turkey. But this population is interbreeding with Rio Grande wild turkeys, which have grown and expanded around the Davis Mountains. And uh, this population will likely become more of a, a hybrid turkey in the coming years, a Mirio, if you will. You can see the green area represents the distribution of the Rio Grande wild turkey. Obviously, the Rio Grande is king here in Texas. We have more Rio Grande turkeys in Texas than any place else in the world. And uh, even though the eastern wild turkey is the most widely distributed and, and uh, uh, population in North America, the Rio Grande is uh, still king here in Texas. And the yellow represents the distribution of the eastern wild turkey in Texas, found primarily in islands and blocks. As I mentioned, the Rio Grande turkey is the most abundant subspecies here in the state. It's also the smallest of the three subspecies, with adult males typically weighing in at less than 20 pounds. And again, they range over the western two-thirds of the state. Identifying this bird, typically you can do that just by the county that you're in, showing the map earlier of the distribution of the bird. But also you can uh, identify them sometimes by, by the coloration of the feathers. Um, the Rio Grande typically will have a more of a lighter band on the, out, um, the outside of the uh, tail fan on the secondary feathers on the tail fan. There's some arrows on the slide there pointing to those. And those are usually going to be a cinnamon to a buff color. However, they can range from this almost solid white to almost solid brown, like what you would see on a Miriam's on the, on the one end of the spectrum on the kind of the whitish coloration or an Eastern on the other end. The subspecies name is intermedia, and that's kind of reflected in this in this uh, variable nature of this bird. The eastern wild turkey is the second most abundant subspecies in Texas, but it's still rare. It's the largest of the three subspecies with adult males weighing in typically over 20 pounds, and it ranges over the eastern third of the state, but in island populations for the most part. This bird can also be distinguished by where it occurs. This bird's going to be found in the piney woods of East Texas and portions of the post oak savanna in kind of the northeastern area of the post oak savanna and other areas of the eastern post oak savanna. Um, this also can be distinguished again by the coloration of the bird. It's a much darker bird relative to the, the other subspecies, especially the Rio Grande. Um, the tail band is typically uh, more of a dark chestnut color, especially that outer band on the primary and secondary feathers on the tail fan. As you can see, the arrows pointing to those, uh, those feathers. We used to have wide distribution of turkeys in East Texas and throughout Texas, but we did have massive populations decline, declines uh, occur and began to occur in the 1880s, and those continued through the turn of the 20th century. Uh, market hunters took a huge toll on these populations. Uh, they would go out and, and shoot as many uh, deer, turkey as they could, uh, using whatever the method they could get uh, or could effectively catch those birds with, and they'd ship those birds off to eastern markets. Early settlers also had an effect. They weren't going down to the local supermarket and buying their turkey meat. They were uh, they were living off the land. They either grew it or they shot it. And uh, this unregulated harvest through uh, market hunters and subsistence hunting uh, played a huge role in the decline of the population, especially in the eastern half of the state. Um, significant um, habitat alterations around the turn of the 20th century 
uh, was kind of the final nail in the coffin uh, for eastern turkeys and a lot of our uh, populations in the rest of the eastern half of the state. The history of regulations in Texas really paints a picture of just how early Texans were recognizing the declining turkey population. You can see here that in 1881, three and a half months of the year were closed to take. So in 1881, they were already recognizing a declining turkey population. In 1897, trapping was outlawed for five months of the year. And in 1903, a 25-bird per day bag limit was set over a five-month season. Today, Texas is considered one of the most liberal states when it comes to our quail harvest. We have a 15-bird bag limit over a four-month season. Now imagine a 25-bird bag limit for a bird that stands three feet tall. You could see it a mile away, and you can do that over five months, and you can shoot them off the roofs. You can trap them. You can do just about whatever you want to. Not a real sustainable uh, practice there. By 1941, the season was closed in East Texas, but it's a little bit late because by 1942, the Game, Fish, and Oyster Commission estimated that less than 100 turkeys remained in East Texas. In the 1940s, 1950s, and 60s, we were having tremendous success with the restoration of the Rio Grande wild turkey. So there was some positive going on with turkey during that time period. In 1969, we had our first spring season on Rios in Kerr County. And in 1974, turkey tags were added to our hunting licenses. The restoration of the wild turkey kicked off in the 1920s with efforts from the Game, Fish, and Oyster Commission. Early trapping methods were primitive and relied on techniques that had been used by Native Americans and early settlers. This pole trap is an example of one of those primitive techniques. We, over the years, we became more efficient at catching birds. This is a picture of Billy Don Davis and uh, his Davis walk-in trap. This is just simple cattle panels and T-posts with a funnel, kind of like a perch trap for turkeys. Uh, you just bait the outside of that. This is still used today for catching Rio Grande turkeys. It's really effective for that subspecies. Um, one biologist can go out and, and trap a number of birds by sep spreading these up and down a, a river or some other area occupied by turkeys. We'll show a quick video. We'll see if this works for everybody. Um, this is a video of a drop net. And drop nets are really effective for trapping uh, Rio Grande wild turkeys. We can catch as many as 100 birds in one drop of a drop net. The use of the use of walk-in traps and later drop nets made it possible to catch just large numbers of Rio Grande wild turkeys. And we also had um, a remnant population of Rio Grande that so provided opportunity for us to start restoration. And using the, these methods from 1920 to 2000, over 33,000 Rio Grande wild turkeys were trapped and released across Texas. The Rio Grande Restoration Program has been a tremendous success, and Texas currently hosts the highest density of Rio Grande wild turkeys in the world. We also have the highest density of hunters and the highest harvest. And in some years, um, had the highest harvest of any other state uh, in North America. Today, TPWD considers approximately 95% of the suitable Rio Grande wild turkey range to be occupied by wild turkeys. But the landscape is changing and new opportunities do arise from time to time. The restoration of the eastern wild turkey took a different approach than that used for Rios. In 1942, as I mentioned, the Game Fish and Oyster Commission estimated that less than 100 turkeys remained in Texas. So there weren't a lot of turkeys out there to be trapped. In addition to those low numbers of wild turkeys, trapping methods were also limited. Eastern turkeys do not readily walk into walk-in traps or walk under drop nets. So catching these birds were difficult and finding birds to catch were difficult. For those reasons, early restoration efforts relied on pin-reared eastern turkeys, pin-reared eastern real hybrid turkeys, and also rios. These methods all failed, and today it's illegal to release pen raised turkeys into the wild. It wasn't until the 1960s when the use of cannon nets 
create an opportunity for large-scale restoration of the eastern wild turkey. And from the 1960s and 1970s, the restoration of the eastern wild turkey was a huge success for most of the eastern turkey's historic range. Unfortunately, Texas still lacked the wild resident birds to support restoration efforts, so we lagged behind many of these other states for several decades. Show one more quick video of uh, some rocket netting, give you an idea of how we were able to catch some of these birds. Hope that worked for you guys. So as you can see, this net is something we can hide, we can camouflage, and then when the birds come in proximity of the net, we can shoot it over the birds. Um, creates a great opportunity to catch large numbers, unlike what we had historically. So from 1979 to 2000, over 7,000 turkeys were trapped and released in 58 central and east Texas counties using birds from other states. And what we did at the time was what we called a block stocking approach. We'd go to five to ten locations across the county and release 15 to 20 birds per site. Block stocking was successful. Texas went from less than 100 wild turkeys in East Texas in the 1940s to an estimated population of 10,000 birds today. And we have a spring turkey season in several counties that were stocked. However, we were not as successful as we had hoped. Texas began re-examining our stocking methodology in the late 1990s, and in 2000, Dr. Royal Lopez published his super stocking model, which recommended a higher stocking rate than the traditional 15 to 20 birds used in TPW's block stocking approach. The approach called for the release of approximately 80 turkeys, usually 60 hens and 20 males, and a mix of both juvenile and adult birds. In 2007, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department funded research through Stephen F. Boston State University to do a real-world test of Dr. Lopez's superstocking model, and we had great success. Based on the success of that stocking method, TPWD has now reopened the Eastern Turkey Restoration Program and is now evaluating sites for restoration in East Texas. One more quick video here. Our first restoration efforts took place in 2014 using the block stocking, the super stocking approach, and we released 247 birds on three locations in East Texas. A single site was partially stocked this winter. Other potential future release sites are currently under evaluation. For information on our super stocking and stocking efforts in East Texas, you can uh, go to the Texas Parks and Wildlife website and look at our turkey page. There's a fact sheet there that goes into more detail on that. As I mentioned earlier, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department considers approximately 95 percent of the suitable Rio Grande wild turkey range to currently be occupied. So today, Texas Parks and Wildlife rarely uh, coordinates Rio Grande restoration efforts. However, Land managers interested in restoring wild turkeys in portions of the historic range or the range of the Rio Grande wild turkey where birds are not utterly occupied can visit with their local biologist. Uh, but this is uh, not something that happens on a regular basis. To find your local biologist, you can go to our website, tpwd.texas.gov forward slash wildlife biologist. And our department offers uh, free and non-binding uh, wildlife management recommendations. Wild turkeys are more or less, are no longer more or less a byproduct of the landscape. Um, now and at least in the near future, all of those places receiving purposeful management will be able to sustain wild turkey populations. 
So management is going to be a huge key now and in the future for sustaining or growing populations of wild turkeys. There are four broad categories that cover the needs of wild of uh, most wild animals, including wild turkeys. And I got these listed here: uh, food, water, cover, and space. Space is probably the most critical. A wild turkey can have a home range of several thousand acres, and a suitable population may require tens, if not hundreds of thousands of acres of usable space. Now, this does not imply that every acre is ideal turkey habitat, but it has to be usable in some way, either for movement, uh, feeding, cover, etc. I would prefer to see a large landscape of marginal habitat with periodic islands of good habitat than a small area of very good habitat in a large landscape of unusable space. Quantity is as important, if not more important, than simple quality in most cases. I also list hunters in the scenario for managing wild turkeys. Hunter conservationists are the reason wild turkeys are on the landscape today and are the best insurance for turkeys in the wild in the future. But it's important to point out that the most important person in the woods or in the pasture is typically the man driving the tractor and the man holding the gun. These are the individuals who make the decisions about what the habitat will look like and what it will and what will and will not get shot. Managers can influence habitat, but they have no influence over the weather. We can manipulate the percentage of bare ground, weeds, grasses, shrubs, and trees. And that's what we're going to talk about here is what we can impact. But before we get into that, we have to understand a little bit about population dynamics. So what drives these birds, what it helps to create a sustained population. And what we know about turkeys is that gobblers are going to display in the spring of the year to establish dominance and attract females. But beyond breeding those females, the male plays a very little limited role or no role beyond breeding the hen in the reproductive or recruitment effort. Gobblers don't incubate eggs and they don't brood young. And this is the reason why we can have a spring turkey season. Timing the spring turkey season to assure that most of our hens have been bred or better yet, are even incubating eggs already, is a very sustainable harvest strategy and one the department strives for. Once a hen is bred, she's going to go out and find a suitable nest site. Typically, she's going to walk across the landscape until it hits her that it's time to lay an egg, and then she's going to go find a place right there close by uh, that meets a uh, suitable nesting cover if it's available. The hen's going to select a nest typically in thick grass and forbs, and it's usually going to be associated with some type of low-growing woody cover. Nests are fairly simple. It's just a slight depression in the ground and typically shaded with about 20 inches of vertical cover, so uh, the grass or something else uh, going up and down to camouflage that nest. Hens are going to lay one egg a day until the clutch is complete. An incubation does not begin until that last egg has been laid. And then she's going to sit on that nest for up to 28 days. So if you imagine the first egg goes on the ground on day one, if she lays a 12 uh, egg clutch and then sits on that nest for 28 days, that's 40 days that that first egg has been sitting on the ground. Take a chicken egg someday and set it out in your yard for 40 days and see how long it lasts. Um, a lot of these nests do not make it through the entire uh, nesting period. And it is a time when a lot of nests are lost and we lose a lot of our hens sitting on nests. Hens are going to sit on those nests once incubation begins for at least 23 hours a day and sometimes two to three days at a time without leaving that nest. When they do leave the nest, they're only going to leave for about an hour or less at a time. And again, that's a very high period of mortality for hens. To remedy this mortality, it's good to provide a landscape that provides a lot of nesting habitat. Um, by limiting nesting habitat, we push that population of hens into smaller and smaller areas, which makes them easier to pick off 
for predators. We typically would like to see those hens widely distributed across the landscape, but adequate nesting cover must be available. Reproduction and recruitment is driven or drives uh, population sustainability. Uh, production is greatly impacted by cumulative rainfall the previous winter and spring. However, hens and poults can be negatively impacted by heavy rains during the nesting and brood rain period. Excessive heat can also be a negative uh, impact on reproduction. Hens will stop nesting once we get into multiple consecutive days of uh, triple digits. So three or four hundred, day, hundred degree days in a row and we'll start seeing the hens um, abandoning nest. Also our poults with the same sort of situation, multiple days, 100 degree days, if they don't have good thermal cover on the landscape, they can, we can start losing poults due to uh, those environmental factors. Whenever a nest is complete and poults begin to hatch, they are precocial and they usually leave the nest within about 24 hours of hatching. Um, they're fully feathered and can move across the ground feeding themselves. They can't fly for up to 10 days to two weeks, and only about 30% of the poults are going to survive to four weeks of age. It's for this reason that we need to provide really um, adequate brood rearing cover. And summer and spring and summer ranch conditions can really drive recruitment because that's going to provide that brood rearing cover. It's the most critical time period for turkeys. Um, the hen sitting on the nest, the poults, once they've hatched, um, is really what drives recruitment and sustaining a population. And what we want on the, on the land is her basis cover about boot high to knee high. This height of vegetation is tall enough to hide our poults, but short enough that the hens can see over that vegetation to keep an eye out for predators. This vegetation provides nesting cover at that height, screening cover, again, to hide those poults, bugging areas uh, because that's what those poults need to put on their flight feathers to get them off the ground and uh, and roosting in trees that helps to increase their survival. Um, so bugs are critical there and they're fine to found that type of cover and also thermal cover to protect them from the elements. So listed here are three tools that I think are pretty critical for, uh, for wild turkey management, that being prescribed fire, forest management, and grazing. I've also listed as some other tools, roost management, but that's primarily for rios and also predator control. And we'll go into these just a little bit. Um, how these tools are used and the importance of each will depend on the landscape and where, you, where you're working. Uh, TPWD biologists, again, can provide free and non-binding recommendations uh, to help you meet those goals and identify what limiting factors might be on your landscape or on your property. So turkeys live on the ground and would rather run than fly, and their main defense is their eyesight. Turkeys must be able to see and walk through their habitat uh, in order to use it, and they can never be too far away from some type of escape cover, usually uh, some type of woody cover. Any areas that don't meet these requirements really cannot be considered usable space. Forests can be uh, managed with prescribed fire, mulching, herbicides, and sometimes long-standing grazing practices to keep that open understory appearance. Um, prescribed fire is a tool that's, uh, that many of our biologists uh, recommend. Um, it typically mirrors some, somewhat the uh, historic maintenance of forest and keeping the savannas open. Um, even though it's uh, not quite the same. This picture here represents usable space for wild turkeys. A turkey can easily see through this forest uh, and move through this forest. And this site specifically has received a periodic prescribed fire for the last uh, one or two decades on about a three-year rotation. And really all the site like this would need is, is simple maintenance. The right side's been burned on that three-year rotation. The uh, left side on the corner on the left side of the fence has not received fire in probably 100 plus years. Um, if you were a turkey and you made defense with your eyesight, the area on the right would provide a uh, much better and suitable space for you. 
And again, we want to keep about 100% or 100 feet plus feet of visibility and uh, just maintaining this with fire. This, on the other hand, is not turkey habitat. Um, this forest is not usable. Turkeys can't see through it. They can't move through it. If you want to know if your woods are usable, just go for a hike through your woods. If you can move and see through those woods easily, the site is likely usable for wild turkeys. If you have to get on your knees and crawl through the site or just look at it and say, I'm not walking through there, then uh, perhaps it's not usable for turkeys. This site is in a desperate need for, of some type of active management before it can become or be identified as turkey habitat, either some type of mechanical or chemical treatment followed up with prescribed fire on a periodic basis uh, would be a reasonable habitat management prescription for a site like this. So this image represents what I would consider pretty decent uh, turkey habitat. Whenever we're managing for turkeys, we want to have good open forest, but we also want to have uh, uh, scattered openings that provide good brood ring habitat, something that's going to be attractive to insects, but also provide the right structure, the height of vegetation uh, to, to hide those boats, and but not too tall that the hens can't see through it. So this pasture has good height on the grasses. Uh, it's, shorter than the hem, but taller than the pulse. It has a diversity of plants and some escape cover uh, relatively close. The site could probably use a little bit of grazing to increase bare ground, maybe some, ro some rotational mowing. Uh, but for the most part, this is a, a site that provides pretty good uh, turkey habitat. This, on the other hand, does not provide very good turkey habitat. An adult turkey could easily move to this site and use this site. But what we're looking to sustain a population is that recruitment, getting the turkey off the nest with those poults and getting those poults to four weeks of age. This site provides almost no escape cover or, uh, or screening cover for those poults. So a, a red-tailed hawk um, several hundred yards away could pick off just about every poult that dared to walk out in an area like this. Management on this site, you just need to increase the herbaceous vegetation height. Uh, probably accomplish that through uh, through grazing practices and promoting native grasses and forbs. This is another uh, image that we see quite a bit. So while excessive grazing could be a problem, over mowing and over manicuring of pastures could also be a problem. You look at this picture and you have to ask yourself, where does the yard stop and the pasture begin? Um, mowing is often a recreational activity for a lot of landowners this day, these days. This reduces wildlife habitat and promotes exotic vegetation. As with the overgrazed pasture in the previous slide, adult turkeys can see and move through this area, but it offers little in the way of, uh, of providing brood cover. So we talked a little bit about predator management earlier being kind of that uh, fourth or fifth practice that you might consider. When I think about predator management, I want to make sure that I've done everything else I can do on that landscape before I take take a stab at this. If you're not providing adequate brood ring cover and nesting cover, then you're just spinning your wheels on, on predator management. If your predator control is not helping you get above 66% annual survival, which is about the statewide average uh, across all age classes um, for our turkeys, if you're not getting above that, with your predator control practices, then you're really not doing anything. We know that most of our mortality occurs through our nesting females, their eggs, and their post less than two weeks of age. So the way we can remedy that um, is typically by providing or focusing on that habitat structure first and then identifying the predators that may be impacting our nesting or our, our poles. There have been quite a few studies done looking at, at uh, the predator components on, on uh, wild turkeys, uh, mostly on Rio Grande wild turkeys, because you can bump a Rio Grande turkey off a nest and she's likely to come back, whereas an eastern wild turkey, you bump her off a nest, she probably won't come back. So there have been a few studies done looking at what was going in and depredating nests. And raccoons, almost no matter where we go, uh, we were getting pictures of those. Uh, rat snakes, coach whips also provided a uh, played a role in nest predation. Um, this hen actually fought off this, this rat snake and, uh, and still had a successful nest. Feral hogs were captured on a lot of images. 
Um, one thing about feral hogs that we found was a lot of times they're more of a secondary or tertiary predator. So that snake went in there or, or some other predator went in, disturbed that nest, and then the feral hog followed up. Um, when you were to probably go out and find a destroyed nest and saw the hog damage close by the tracks, you might assume that the hog was the main nest predator, but a lot of times they are secondary or tertiary predators. Now that said, feral hogs are exotics and deserve every bit of persecution we can put upon them because they are uh, a big negative on the landscape. Some other predators that are identified on some of these hill country in South Texas studies um, looked at or found possums, great horned owls, red tailed hawks, armadillos, skunks, coyotes, bobcats, coach whips, ravens, crows, woodpeckers, jays, caracaras, and gray fox. So there's no limit or no shortage of predators that uh, will impact a, a nest or an adult turkey or a pulse out there on the landscape. So a quick quiz for folks. We did a study in East Texas where we went out to, to old nest sites. And I want you all to look at this list of, of species here and, and kind of vote on which one you think was the top nest predator in East Texas. And I'll give you just a couple of seconds and talk about this a little bit. But So go ahead and vote on that if you want to. So uh, we went out to nest sites in East Texas where, uh, where eastern turkeys had nested the year before, and we took chicken eggs and put them in those nests. So this is an artificial nest study. And we put cameras up and tallied up which, uh, which uh, predators were having the greatest impact. And, we had, and all of these were identified as, as nest predators in that study. But of the 10 or so species listed here, there was one that was above and beyond the top nest predator. And we'll go ahead and move forward. I see a lot of raccoons popping up down there. One crow. Let's see what else we have. Raccoon. The top nest predator in this study was the American crow. And that surprised a lot of people, I imagine. The American crow, out of 118 nests uh, that were depredated, 57 of them were the American crow, 48.3%. The raccoon was a close second, and typically, no matter where you're at in the state, is going to be right up there. The opossum also had a big impact. And other than that, we had uh, the gray fox with two and unknown with three. Now, if you look at bobcat and coyote, those two predators that are typically the ones that, that most people target when they do predator, um, predator control, they only accounted for less than 1% of all the nests that were depredated in this study. Armadillos and woodpeckers depredated as many nests as bobcats and coyotes. Now this fortunate graduate student also had the pleasure of going out and collecting a lot of fecal samples of bobcats and coyotes to identify um, what remains were being identified in, the, in those fecal samples. And of those, they found zero occurrence of uh, of bobcats or turkeys and bobcats and coyotes. Now this is just in East Texas. Uh, there's no doubt that bobcats and coyotes have a huge impact, but a lot of times bobcats and coyotes will also depredate on raccoons and possums and some of these other uh, uh, bigger nest predators. So predator control can be a very complex issue and sometimes by harvesting or, or taking, removing bobcats and coyotes, you may actually be providing opportunities for some of these other nest predators to uh, to increase their population. So predator control goes beyond just one or two species. It can include uh, species that we're not even legally allowed to take, such as, such as raptors. So uh, a lot of thought and consideration needs to go into that and not um, just go out and, and uh, go after a couple of species. We have to be very proactive. And habitat management always has to play a role in those efforts. Now hunting can play a huge role in gobbler mortality. Some of our highest mortality rates for gobblers are brought on by hunters. But hunter conservations or conservationists are one of the reasons why wild game is so prevalent in Texas today. State wildlife agencies are funded by hunters through the sale of hunting license 
hunting licenses, and PR funding received from the sale of firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment. It is this PR funding, paid for by hunters, that has covered the expenses of most of our game restoration efforts that have occurred. Um, a lot of our species that we're hunting today, turkeys, uh, white-tailed deer, would not be on the landscape today without the funding provided by hunters through direct sale of hunting equipment and also through uh, hunting licenses. Hunting also supports habitat management, which benefits a number of non-game species. Uh, the, the economic value that comes from hunting leases, hunting lease and uh, and improving local economies is also a major impact. So, hunting is a great uh, component on the landscape, and I don't believe we would be where we are today without without our hunters. So, thank you to the hunters. So one question I get often is, what can I plant for turkeys? Um, what do turkeys eat? What can I plant to help have turkeys on my property? A lot of people just uh, begin to assume that food is the limiting factor for turkeys, but usually it's it's going to be your, your structure, your habitat. But this is a question I get quite a bit, so we'll go into this. Um, but really, when we talk about turkeys and what they eat, it should be, what do turkeys not eat? These are not picky birds. Uh, they will eat just about anything they can catch, fit in their mouth, and swallow. Uh, so food generally is not a limiting factor. If you have the habitat to support turkeys, they're going to find something to eat. They will graze like cattle. They will they will fish for uh, for crustaceans. Uh, they will eat insects. Um, they will dig through your cow manure and take dung beetles. So uh, typically, food is not a limiting factor. This is an image that was taken from a gobbler that was that was harvested in uh, Louisiana, and uh, you can see that the crawfish here was was found in the crop, and that's not really uncommon in uh, in Louisiana. Um, so, but when we think about food, one thing that we really have to consider is is the value of that food and what these birds actually need. So, we have to think about just the maintenance of that of that bird. What percentage of crude protein does that bird need to live from day to day? And that's usually identified at about 13% crude protein. We have to think about egg production. We have to think about those hens, and usually, so above and beyond maintenance, about 17% crew protein, along with some other uh, requirements there of calcium and, and other things. And then for poults, we have to think about what do they need, and that's where the biggest requirement is, and that's typically where food can be the most limiting. It's going to be insects for those poults, because insects are going to provide the highest crew protein. I mentioned earlier that poults can't fly for the first couple of weeks of life. They have to put on flight feathers within 10 days to two weeks to get off the ground. And to do that, they have to have a ton of protein. 28% uh, crew protein in the first four weeks of life and 24% crew protein in the following four weeks after that. So that's where food can potentially be a limiting factor is on the requirements for, uh, for protein. Now we think about some of the foods that might be out there on the landscape artificially. We might think about deer corn. A turkey could eat deer corn until it was as fat as it could be, and it still would not be enough to survive. So about seven to eight percent crude protein found in corn. Now sunflower seeds can get about seventeen to twenty-three percent crude protein. So sunflower seeds are a great resource. Um, maybe not all that economical to spread, but we can do that with uh, native sunflowers. Sorghum, another food food that's out there fairly common is, is maybe just might meet our crude protein requirements. Native grasses, especially early in, in the growing season, can provide up to eight, up to 15 percent crude protein. And a lot of times this time of year when we're starting to get green up out on the landscape, you can see turkeys out in the field just grazing like cattle. And uh, this is a great time of year for them to do that because they can really meet a lot of their nutritional requirements. But insects are really what make or break it for the hens. They're going into the nesting season, but really for the poults once they're born, that 50 to 75 percent crew protein, and that'll make up the majority of their diet um, during those first four weeks of life, even into the first uh, um, eight weeks of life. So a little bit about habitat management here. So we know that the hens require about 20 to 30 inches of vertical cover, so we can think about that on the landscape, providing lots of vegetation. We know that they want to nest in some sort of a low-growing woody cover. So having this visual, we can identify what we need on our landscape. It's not that manicured pasture. It's a pasture or 
rangeland that provides good boot high to neat high herbaceous cover with scattered low growing woody cover. For eastern turkeys, a lot of times this will happen in a forested setting. For rios, that might happen in more of a rangeland setting. For management of an area like this, we want to promote that low growing woody cover in association with native herba herbaceous cover. So again, we don't want to mow all of our pastures on an annual basis. Mowing is a, can be a great tool um, as long as we don't mow everything every year. Prescribed fire is another great tool, especially in a forest setting, because it will often top kill that woody vegetation. We get re-sprouts of that woody vegetation, which keeps that, that cover at about the right height, usually less than about waist high or about three to four feet high. Um, it provides good nesting structure for these birds. So fire, especially in a forest setting, it's great for, for providing um, a good nesting cover. Managing our brood habitat. Again, just like with the nesting cover, we want to promote that knee high, that boot high to knee high native grasses and forbs, but we still want that low growing woody cover in association with that. Uh, when those poles are out running across the ground, they can't fly, uh, so they need to be able to get in some type of escape cover. So having something that's real weedy next to something that's fairly thick with grass or low growing woody cover can provide that escape cover. Uh, when you, all you can do is run on the ground. You're usually depending on, on your feet to get you away from predators or hiding. And uh, providing good uh, brood cover can help to, uh, to uh, assure this. Our management options on a site like this would be, uh, or on any site, would be to promote your native grasses, uh, convert exotic pastures if, if that's what you have is a great management recommendation. Um, utilizing rotational grazing strategies is always a good recommendation and not mowing your entire pastures annually. And if you do mow, waiting till um, uh, about halfway through the summer, usually around July before you start mowing. For those micro managers out there, we can also uh, uh, do little small tidbits here and there. Turkeys are going to typically seek out areas that have been recently disturbed with fire, uh, moderate grazing, uh, but we can also create some disturbance and create these little uh, mini food plots by rotating our, our cattle troughs uh, from one area to another. You'll get that hoof action around your cattle trough, pick it up, move it to another spot, create those little island food plots for turkeys. Um, any other disturbances, disc strips, are also something that you can do. Um, increasing plant diversity by promoting forbs is a great way to improve your brood ring habitat. Uh, these forbs are going to increase the availability and diversity of insects on your area, and they're also going to provide seeds uh, during the fall and winter to serve as a, a food source. Quality brood habitat will provide a high number of insects, ease of movement, and screening cover. So you have to have all three of those in combination. Uh, the vegetation should allow the poults to move freely underneath that cover. So you look at the picture on the right, that's kind of like that poults eye view. Um, you see the partridge pea and the, and the croton and other vegetation, that poult can get under that. But it's still at a certain height that the, the hen is going to be towering over it and can see across the landscape. So that's what we're looking for is, is that boot high to knee high vegetation and diversity of forbs is, uh, is really important. We want to promote native grasses over improved pastures. And the reason for this is you have poults less than uh, two weeks old, they can't fly. The picture on the right is that improved pasture. Uh, typically, improved pastures are either too thick, so don't provide an opportunity for a poult to run through them easily, or they're, they're um, recently hayed or, or overgrazed and short, which then doesn't provide the screening cover that those poults need. The picture on the left represents uh, Native warm season bunch grasses. You can see the paths in between the grasses provides good corridors while at the same time providing screening cover and, and uh, thermal protection for those birds. So this is uh, the reason why we promote native grasses for these uh, ground dwelling birds uh, because that provides ease of movement and, uh, and mobility, <laughs> which is basically the same thing, I guess. Now a little bit about a uh, uh, real grand turkeys. Um, limited roosting cover is probably the primary limiting factor for the distribution of real grand wild turkeys in their western ranges in Texas. Uh, we had a tremendous drought in 2011, and we lost a lot of our old uh, large historic roost, um, and they're gonna, we're going to continue to lose those. 
unfortunately, many of the sites where these old roosts occur aren't seeing the recruitment of young trees, those young cottonwoods or different species to come in and replace those old uh, historic roosts. And this is one of the instances where purposeful management is going to play a huge role. Uh, the loss of these trees or the lack of recruitment of the new trees could be due to changes in hydrology with streams and rivers being dammed. Um, it could be due to browsing by deer and cattle to remove the young uh, trees that would serve as that next generation. It could also be due to infestation of exotic trees and shrubs or maybe a combination of those three things. But the the idea is that we need to make sure we're providing that next generation of roost trees, if that's through uh, protecting the ones that are occurring naturally or going in and actually replanting trees to uh, to provide that next generation of roosting cover. And we don't need to wait until the trees die. We need to make sure that we're doing that periodically um, over time so that we have a continual regeneration and replacement of those roost trees. So purposeful management is needed to support this uh, going forward. We can't just rely on uh, on nature to, to take its course all the time in these situations with the way uh, the landscape has changed. So this is going to be important uh, moving forward. The end game is more turkeys on the ground through production, that's nesting, re-nesting, uh, nesting success, recruitment, getting those poults to four weeks of age and eight weeks of age so they're joining that population of turkeys, and sustainability and growth through providing large landscapes of usable habitat. Now, I don't know if I've used all my time here or not, but I'm pretty much done. I want to give you guys a couple of uh, quotes that I like to end with. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And the world is run by those who show up. So thank you guys for showing up. And I'll take any questions that you guys have. Let's see. Any questions? Is there a restoration program planned for the Smith County area? Clint, you want me to just answer that down in the Q&A section? Yeah, sorry, I was talking to you and my, my deal was still muted. Um, and so I, I completely missed it. I have a couple questions here for you, um, but okay. you can certainly hit that one because I did not see it. Okay, well, Smith County, yes, there is a, the restoration program in East Texas. We're, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to our website. It's uh, tpwd.texas.gov forward slash turkey. And on the left side of that page, there's a, a PDF under publications that's called the uh, Eastern Turkey Stocking Fact Sheet. You can download that, and it basically goes through. Smith County is an area that we're looking to do uh, restoration. It kind of identifies some of the prerequisites that we're looking for a site uh, that deal with fragmentation and, and size of a management area that we're looking to work on. Um, but you can, uh, Smith County is not one of our focal areas, but pretty much anywhere in East Texas we will, uh, we will, uh, we will address if we can provide suitable habitat. So download that or you can reach out to me and I can send that to you directly. Okay, uh, let's see. Jump to the questions that I had typed out from earlier. Are there any public hunting areas that have a huntable population of Easterns in Texas? Sure, there are, there are a few areas. Uh, there's some, some wildlife management areas up in, in Northeast Texas with Cattle National Grasslands and uh, Pat Mays WMA. There's also some lands down in Southeast Texas. And these that area up in the, the Red River, Northeast Texas area is probably one of our best strongholds for turkeys in the state. So those are two public areas up there. Um, you go down southeast and look at some of the U.S. Forest Service lands, the Sabine National Forest still provides some good hunting opportunities. And um, you can visit with some of our wildlife management area uh, managers, uh, Kevin Harriman in northeast Texas or Bill Adams in southeast Texas. And they can help provide you some directions on public lands. You can also visit with the U.S. Forest Service in uh, southeast Texas, and they can provide you with 
locations and some recommendations on where to go hunting. Okay. The next question, I believe you had a map up earlier. Uh, what counties in Texas have the most easterns? Yeah, I kind of hit on that a little bit, but uh, northeast Texas, Red River County has always been known for having a real high density of, of uh, eastern turkeys. You can go right over to Lamar and Fannin County up there, and they represent some fairly uh, good densities relative to Texas. Um, down in southeast Texas, you'll be looking at Newton, Jasper County, uh, Sabine County, and probably Nacogdoches County as having some of the highest densities of eastern. So some island populations there in northeast Texas and southeast Texas. Okay. Uh, next question is about burning. It says it's obvious that prescribed burning is extremely important in East Texas for habitat. What about the timing of burning, or is there a date that is too late? Timing and scale of fire is always uh, something important for us to, to consider. Um, depending on where you're at in the landscape, if we're talking about the piney woods, you can get much better control on your woody vegetation by burning during the growing season. Um, if you have high quality nesting cover, you might want to avoid those areas and, and go to those areas that have been three plus years without a prescribed fire because our turkeys typically are going to nest in an area that's been burned in the last six months to the last two years. So uh, avoiding uh, burning an area that you have recently burned in the last, say, year or two during that primary nesting season of about um, April 15, April 20, through about the first uh, or the first week of June would probably be a time period to avoid burning your key nesting cover. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to. We want those turkeys to be as widely distributed during the nesting season as possible. Um, but that said, if we're burning at a certain scale, um, small blocks scattered across the landscape, uh, we can remedy that by maintaining good distribution of nesting cover across the landscape. If we're talking about the post oak savanna, it can get fairly difficult to uh, to burn in some of those areas during the during the growing season. Um, so burning those areas anytime you can is great. But really, anytime you can burn is better than not burning at all. I hope I addressed that. I believe so. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next question is, uh, who should we contact? first concerning uh, getting considered for super stocking, and is there a minimum acreage required? Yeah, the minimum acreage is 10,000 acres of uh, contiguous habitat. Now, that doesn't mean that it's an individual landowner or an individual property. Most properties in East Texas are um, three to 500 acres or less. So working with neighbors is, is certainly uh, uh, encouraged to, to bring this through. So. Uh, um, 10,000 acres is the minimum acreage. They can reach out to me. Um, I did mention that uh, that fact sheet is available on our website on our turkey page, or they can reach out to me directly, and I can send them that fact sheet that kind of goes through that, uh, those prerequisites that are required. And once we uh, get to that point, we can uh, they can reach out to me again, and, and we'll set up meetings and begin those discussions. That sounds great. Um... We had a question come in that somebody had missed the first part of the presentation. I just wanted to throw in there real quick that uh, we will or we did record this webinar, and I posted a link up in the chat window that you'll be able to follow that link and go go watch this video after it gets loaded up. So it'll be on our web page, and then it will also be on um, YouTube. So it looks like our last question <clears throat> that I had for you, did you say that hens stay on the nest while incubating? They don't go to the roost at night. Uh, hens going to go to the roost every night until that last egg is laid. So they're going to lay an egg and completely remove themselves from that nest area. When that last egg is laid, they're going to sit on that nest day and night, um, sometimes for up to three days at a time. If they do get off that nest, it's go to get it's less than – for less than an hour, typically walking a short distance to maybe get a drink of water, a quick bite to eat, defecate, then right back on the nest. Um, so they may, typically they won't get off that nest um, any less than about uh, 23 hours at a time, and they may sit on that nest for up to 72 hours straight without leaving the nest. And again, when they do leave, it's only for a short period and right back because they don't want those eggs to cool off. Uh, so the incubation continues for almost up to 28 days. So a very long time period, a lot of mortality. Um, so that's something to think about. 
Okay, we had one more come in. Uh, this gentleman asks, have you considered stocking at the Mineola Nature Preserve along the Sabine River? Um, I believe that's in a, I think I saw that question around Smith County. Smith County. Yeah, yeah. no, there's uh there have been a, we've had some calls about that area. Um, we do have some, some folks that work for the department that have been working in that area. So we haven't received an, an official request yet to do an evaluation. I'm not sure what the size of Nature Preserve is, but up and down the Sabine River, there should be opportunities to do to restoration if we can get a good group of landowners, um, public and private, um, working together, and then we'll do go through the evaluation process. So be glad to look into any site that can meet those uh, those prerequisites. You know, the 10,000 acres. Contiguous landscape um, would certainly be willing and happy and look forward to working with anybody that can meet those prerequisites. Okay, one more that came in. Uh, in Burnett County, we've been feeding protein for quail. Will turkey eat this as well? Oh, yeah, they'll eat it up. They're not picky. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I can go into more detail. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, they will eat it. They'll eat your uh, the protein for your deer feed. They'll eat your protein for your quill. They'll eat just about anything they can get. We typically, when we bait our drop nets or any of our our trapping, uh, we do that with a uh, with either a milo, crack corn, or whole corn, um, and that's typically what they they eat it like candy, and they will do the same with your uh, with your any protein feed. Okay. 